Stefan von Lohmar. Let us explore the man and his legacy as seen through the eyes of friends and colleagues. I first met uh, Steve, may I call him Steve, at the mid-1980s at IBM, first as a postdoc then as a research staff member. And first I thought, my God, it's Jerry Garcia. But no, it's Steve von Lohmar. Uh, I vaguely recall, I don't know if it was the first time or not, I vaguely recall uh, him doing experiments in crappy magnets around uh, 20 kilogauss. IBM is a big place, so I first sort of noticed Steve during this talk, the physical sciences talk on this, this uh, localization transition in magnetic spin glasses or something like that. And the thing I remember distinctly was he, afterwards he was just sweating like crazy. And it was just, he, I said, who's this guy <laughs> who sweats so much after the talk? Well, we had many interactions through that time, you know, high level and low level and everything in between. I'd say, uh, well, I mean, your first impressions is he's a serious person. I mean, he has a, a Vaughn in his name, so you know, it's, that's, that's a seriousness. He's from somewhere. You look at Steve's from a distance, you might not think he's very athletic. But actually he is. And there was one time, there was, I remember one time really, that really well, when Steve was trying to put some wires in, like the printer cable up in the ceiling. And you know, he couldn't quite reach it. So I, I went there and I stood on his desk and was reaching up into these acoustic tiles, trying to put this wire in, leaning forward. And I started to lose my balance. I started falling. And the first thing I did was I grabbed the acoustic tiles, you know, there's, there's, there's panels that hold the acoustic tile up, and grabbed them. And of course, that didn't help me up either. That just all came tumbling down. So there's acoustic tiles coming down. And then I still had the problem of how am I going to stop? And he caught me. Steve caught me. I, I ended up in his arms. Oh, he was holding me. Steve is the metrosexual man. Or maybe I should say, Steve is the metrosexual man. I think that's the correct thing to say. Um, he, he, it, it's true, he cares awful about, awfully about his appearance. I know that, and he works on that. You can see, well groomed, and, and some, so, so maybe. I mean, he might be in terms, at least f as a scientist, he might be that the metrosexual scientist. If you see him riding around in his uh, beetle convertible with his little hat on, he totally looks uh, like he is this type of uh, individual. You know, if they made some physics version of sex in the city, Steve would probably be a lead character in that. Stefan von Molnar served IBM for 28 years, first as a researcher, then a manager. Well, I was never managed by him, uh, although we both were managers during a, a sad period in IBM's time. Um, I think he was mainly interested in getting physics done, uh, which eventually brought him at odds with uh, some of our lesser lights at IBM. And he'll remember Trey Smith very well. Uh, um, uh, but I think he was mainly interested in having original scientific work done in magnetism. And uh, you know, his management talents were directed towards that uh, that goal. He was a very good at identifying and promoting talent, and I think that's key to, to managing, not only like being there every day and, and, and trying to keep IBM off their backs, but just the fact that he identified these people and, and gave them the freedom to do what they wanted to do. I, mean, you know, I guess those were sort of the idea, you know, before the, the early days, it must have been that was the way things were. Uh, you know, that you, you got good people and you let him do what they were. But he was trying to prolong that as, 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 as the management was coming down and trying to make everyone uh, do learn C++. I think for other experimentalists, uh, he was always anxious to see them, you know, achieve, do good scientific work, um, you know, learn new things, break into new areas. You know, I think he was very discovery oriented, although that, that was a sort of loaded phrase in our, uh, in our aisle, because that was the, the web patented phrase. It was a tough time at IBM, I don't know, that was 92 to 94. 
um, where IBM was really downsizing, and you could you could see there was. It was a tough thing for Steve, you know, and uh, he t takes, I, I think you know, he takes all these things very personally. I mean, it's, he's not, he's a, he, 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 he's sort of, inv he's in, very invested in, in, in his activities. And I, you could see that it, it was, it was, you know, getting him to shake and, and things, the things that he was, that were going on at, at IBM at the time, and the fact that the whole thing was kind of uh, falling apart. I had worked on a particular problem which he uh, thought was very interesting and even though I had stopped working on it about 15 years before, he would still see me at meetings or call me up and ask me if I had the samples. Unfortunately, I wasn't very good at having archived those samples having had about five different jobs at IBM since I had done that research and I had to disappoint him. Uh, he was very, very... Uh, concerned that I had not preserved those samples for posterity. But his enthusiasm for science and his dynamism and his interest is something that really is contagious and definitely something I would like to emulate if I could. But I don't have the energy that he has and I'm 20 years younger than he is. <laughs> Von Molnar's legacy as a manager at IBM will be debated for generations to come. But most historians attribute his rise and fall to his obsession with OS2. It's something that Steve was absolutely focused upon. He wanted it to lead the world in technology. He had a plan. You know, you close the door in Steve's office, he'd pull down a map. The rise and fall of OS2 is illustrated here in this abstract graphic. Stefan recognized that OS2 could essentially walk into the terminal emulator market unchallenged, and that he did. The education market would be trickier Steve brokered a deal with Microsoft to split that market down the middle, only later to famously renege on that covert arrangement. On another front, OS2 began a campaign to invade the small business market, all of which positioned them for what they knew they had to capture in a post-selectric world, the word processing market. This, followed by a deal with the fashion industry, paved the way for an even more ambitious goal, corporate America. And one day I get this call from Steve. You know, and he says, uh, hey, kiddo, you know, there's this new operating system that we're developing at IBM. I really think you need to buy IBM PCs, and you know, it's a good thing to use this software. So I said, uh, sure, Steve. I mean, you've always been there, you know, supportive. I'll certainly do that. So we got this operating system. Of course, it took us a long time to get it working. It kept crashing all the time. But Steve was very supportive. He would always be there on the phone. Why OS2? The first version couldn't print. <laughs> but he never made it. He never made it. At that time, it was Microsoft trying to come with Windows. Actually, I bought OS2. I bought it. And actually, I bought it just before I was leaving IBM. This was in 1994 to take a free copy with me, which I took. I never used it, because at that time when I went to the university, and talking about Stony Brook University, at that time Windows was clearly the winner, and I didn't bother. I still have it, actually, I have it in the same box. I took it with me when I left 11 years ago. Maybe I can sell it in eBay, <laughs> right? I can get a few bucks out of that. Oh, but I still use OS2. What is Stefan von Molnar's real legacy? The magnetic polarons, the metal insulator transition, and the magnetic semiconductors as, as really a remarkable series of, of experiments and, 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 and just remarkable science. And I would say in terms of accomplishments, even much more broadly, uh, that idea maybe what trumps it all is, is, is uh, the people he's, he's, he's found and, 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 and worked with and, and, and promoted, I'd say. I mean, as, as you know, as everyone who's going to be watching this knows, uh, they've all been uh, really successful, and, and it's in large part because Steve gave them the start, and uh, you know, kept wit, kept promoting them too. So, certainly scientifically, Steve is one of the fathers of magnetic semiconductors and one of the fathers of the field of spintronics, and I. Uh, I think he had a vision about the potential of this field far before most of us did, and certainly far before most people working in the field today have had. He encouraged IBM to work in the field. His work on transport, his relationship with Neville Mott, I think led to some groundbreaking work in transport physics and magnetic semiconductors. 
theories and experiments on magnetic polarons and magnetic polaron dynamics are largely due to Steve and the depth of his understanding of these phenomena. And I think his presence has continued throughout his career in terms of notable accomplishments. His work in gradiometers, sensitive magnetometers, his current work on transport and nanostructures, and even the directions he's moved into today in biosensing and uh, biophysical studies are at the cutting edge of science and technology. So he's, it's, I think he, he's somebody whose career is a symbol of not just one notable accomplishment, but a series of accomplishments which have uh, set the landscape for an extremely impressive career, which is still going. But he's not dead yet. No, and I think that's really a misconception that I'd like to clarify right now. He's not dead. And I think that can, that's a little bit exacerbated by these confusions of Steve and Jerry Garcia. So most people hopefully know that Jerry Garcia is dead, but Steve is not dead, so. Well, as a person full of life, this is precisely what comes to mind when I see him. I saw him just a few minutes ago, and he didn't change a bit. I mean, he still has the same little hair that he had at the time, the same amount of white hair on his beard, and he's still full of energy and enthusiasm. And uh, he was complaining at the time, he's still complaining now, so he didn't change at all.